One of the things you're going to find throughout the day is there's obviously an awful lot of common themes, which you'd expect because we're talking about a common theme. And many of the points that Adi's mentioned already will probably come up through my talk and, and, and things that follow. Um, thinking back to that diagram, which I hadn't seen before, with me in the nice T-shirt, which, which was airbrushed on, by the way. I wasn't actually wearing that T-shirt. That's very clever technology for the guy that did it. Um, it does sometimes feel like you're the one that's hanging off the rock because we are pioneering this stuff. And again, as the day goes on, I think you'll find we don't have all the answers. And part of these events is to talk about some of this stuff and to get input from SMEs and others to help us inform the debate. Um, so just bear that in mind. We're also going to hear an awful lot today about the what and the how. There's quite a lot of detail today, which is obviously what a lot of people are interested in. My perspective is slightly different, and I always make an admission first of all here. Professionally, I'm a software engineer before I started doing this crazy day job. So I am morbidly curious about the what and the how, but as some of my, who are here today, some of our software engineers will tell me, it's not my job anymore. I've got to let it go. My job actually is about the why as a CIO. So what I'm going to try to talk about in my presentation is why would a normally relatively sane CIO abandon traditional licensed software and embark on this, this new way of doing things. And hopefully by the time we get to the end of it, you'll realize I am still sane um, and we're doing it for pretty good reasons. So those of you that are local obviously know this, this is, um, I've got that last slide off very quickly because I realize I've not changed the name of the trust. Um, this is Derford Hospital, University Hospitals Plymouth, just down the road. Very, very large, complex, acute hospital. Still, I believe, one of the largest single-site hospitals in Western Europe. A very vibrant organisation, approximately 6,000 staff. We're a tertiary centre, we're a trauma centre. We do pretty much everything that a large acute trust would be expected to do. So, where did we begin? Um, we are fairly traditional, I think, in our approach. We've always had a best of breed approach. There was no such thing as big box solutions back in 99 when I joined the trust. It was very much do the best you can with the best clinical applications you can and integrate them in the best way you can. Try to make the best of what there was. So for, since 99, as I, as I say there, we've done a fair bit. We've actually um, put in a patient administration system. We've been open standards from the start. Pretty much as Adi said, long before the standards today were defined, there have always been some form of open standard. HL7 has been around a long time, DICOM has been around a while. So we've always been open standards based, um, whichever what that standard uh, happened to be at the time. Um, what, what was the standard that, that came and vanished, for those that might remember? Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've had a couple of standards that we've tried to, ITK is the one that springs to my mind, the standards we've tried to uh, follow and the standard kind of died. So you, you just aligned to it and the standard vanished. So we've been very careful about the standards we follow and I'll get into that as, as pretty much as we go on. We've put order communications across the hospital, we've done PACS and RIS three times, I'll explain that as we go on. And we've done some local developments, which you're going to see a lot of today, um, which started life as a product called Salas, and it's being rebadged as a product called Sea Air, in line with everything else that's air that you're going to hear today. Um, so that's a screenshot of where Salas started. This is patient flow management across the hospital. The entire hospital now manages patient flow through the Salas product that was written internally at the Trust. Again, based on all open standard and technologies. And, and this is the kicker for us, we have 190 departmental solutions. That's 190 totally separate, independent clinical solutions. And the key thing with them is they've all got their own bespoke databases. Some purport to have open interfaces. Very few do. They're very much silo-based applications, 190 of them. And obviously, our clinicians want to use one. So that's the kind of challenge we face. Collisions want one, we've got 190, Andy fix it. There is the challenge. Now, this, 
the owner of the, I've got to be very careful today because the person who owns this I think is here. Um, normally I say at these talks, this, this, this is our interface diagram. And this absolutely scares the bejesus out of me every time I see it. Um, you can see July 2017, it's fairly recent. Um, and that is the scale of the complexity that's involved in pulling, tying together uh, the disparate solutions that we've got across the organisation. And that's only fairly superficial clinical messaging that's, that's being carried there. The majority of that is admissions, discharges, transfers, and all of the usual stuff that you carry. Very little clinical information has been carried there. So that gives me a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't have a grey hair on my head before I got onto this, okay? And then we've, we had a, a number of other challenges. It's, it's, not, it's not just tech. Adrian's already touched on some of this. We're wholly locked in by those 190 suppliers. They have got us by our dangly bits. We cannot escape, okay? We cannot migrate data easily. Everyone will tell you this. Clinicians, when you move from one system to another, they want all the data taken across. In reality, we rarely do that. We, we, re we usually take across the minimum we possibly can. And the reason for that is it's incredibly complicated. And to ensure that the data in system B is exactly the same as the data in system A is, is a huge challenge. So what we tend to do is to, and this, this is pretty much, I think, typical across, across the NHS, we will keep product A, read only, ad infinitum, and then we'll start with a blank product B moving forward on day one. And I can say certainly for, for our trust, we've had to do that on, on more than one occasion, where we've had to keep a license for a product we no longer use simply because it's the only way to keep the data. And that's a really compelling reason to just bear in mind as to why we've taken the, the route we've done, because everyone admit that is complete bonkers. Um, and strategic fit, um, we've always been open standard. It's, it's pretty much ingrained in what we do. We want an open standard approach. We want to, to have complete neutrality at all levels in the stack. We don't want to be tied to any supplier other than by functionality. If you provide me the best solution, I want to use your solution. If you don't, I want to be to change you. I want to be to change you easily. I don't want you to hold me in, in any way at all. Now, the end game, for those of you that have been around a while, like me, we used to talk about EPR levels 1 to 6, electronic patient record 1 to 6. That was old money. In decimal terms, it's actually HIMS level 0 to 7. Pretty much the same. Obviously, you don't, you don't really want to be at 0. Um, you've, you've pretty much done nothing. You want to be at level 7, which is you've done it all. You're digital, you've got integrated um, clinical decision support, you've got analytics, you know every aspect about your business and you're doing everything as efficiently and safely as you possibly can. Getting there is an interesting challenge. You don't have to do it sequentially. Um, so we started pretty much at level two. We're digitising our electronic records. We have done packs, as I say, three times. So we're not doing it in order necessarily. We're looking to put electronic observations in as part of, as part of this program I'll talk about. We've done orders and requests. And we're about to go live very, very shortly, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, with OpenEP, which is an open electronic prescribing solution based on the open air framework. But the, the key thing that we will never be able to do with our current strategy, the original strategy, not the one we're about to go into, is clinical decision support and enterprise-wide scheduling. And the real reason why you can't do that on a best-of-breed approach with lots and lots of different databases is because you haven't got that single integrated digital care record. The one way, or the only way in my mind, we have a big debate about fire and all manner of other things, it can become quite heated. But for my mind, the only way you can truly do integrated clinical decision support and enterprise-wide scheduling is when all of your data is held in one place. Because to do it any other way becomes incredibly complex. Um, I'm not saying it can't be technically achieved, but it comes, it, it'll become nearly as complicated as that previous diagram. Imagine that which, as I say, is carrying very, very little 
clinical information. If you imagine that diagram with all of those systems trying to do fire-based integration alone to manage enterprise-wide scheduling and clinical decision support, it, it is absolutely technically achievable, but I would have even more nightmares if that's where we ended up. So the single integrated digital care record, that is, for me, the nirvana. It's, that is the thing that the big box providers will sell, sell the concept to you. If you buy our product, you get that single integrated digital care record. So just hold that in mind. That is, that is where we're trying to get to. And I think everybody's trying to get there, to be perfectly <coughs> honest. This is where we kind of go off on the tangents depending on diff different approaches. So the two ways you can do this, you can buy your way in. So you can buy the Lorenzo's, the Track Cares, the Epics, you know, the, the big box vendors um, that provide all of, the, all of the functionality that, well, they'll tell you they provide all the functionality you need, um, and it'll be on a single record. Lots of benefits to it. It's not, all, it's not all bad with it. It's very much a proven deployment model. The minute you've deployed it, you're using it. Um, you, you can deploy it very straightforwardly. It's a, say it's a very proven model. You get IDCR, the Integrated Digital Care Record, once you've done it. And, and it's a consistent user interface, which is why you know, they're popular with clinicians. You log on once, and you, you've got one view of the world. So that's the, the key kind of benefits. I mean, when you get to vendor lock-in, oh my god, are you locked in? Epic certainly make a really, really big public case that they have never lost a trust. They've never lost a contract. Nobody has ever migrated away from Epic. Um, it's not surprising, really. Uh, you know, if, if, you've, if you've actually taken all the effort to, to put everything into that one solution, proprietary or not, are you really, really going to want to try to get off it? Um, it's certainly it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing for a CIO, I've got to tell you. So proprietary vendor lock-in, absolutely. Um, these solutions do not interoperate. Data migration, absolute hell. So they're the two big things. If you go in, you've got to be sure you want to be in um, because you never want to come out. And most importantly, you've got to have a lot of money. Um, Anecdotally, well, anecdotally, actually, we, we did a strategic outline case for it. For us, the scale of costs for an organisation of our size is somewhere in the region of about £80 million pound to actually take one of these solutions. Um, that's a hard case to make in, t in today's day and age, to be fair. And when we tried to make that case, we were told quite clearly um, that's not really the recommended solution for you guys. You ought to be looking for some, to do something where you can invest incrementally, you can build incrementally, and it fits more with the way the NHS is actually set up to, to fund this kind of work. It's very difficult to try to take cases for £80 million anywhere in the NHS. So we moved in by, by our natural kind of liking of, of open standards. We kind of morphed towards this, this approach of okay, if, if we could do it on an open standards basis and we could do it incrementally, modularly, um, on, on an open standard architecture, we could mitigate the majority of those issues. In particular, we wouldn't be locked in at all. We could get to, we could get to this Nirvana state where once we've done it, we would use products that are the best at what they do. And if they stopped becoming the best at what they do, or, or for some reason we fell out with a supplier, or that they weren't providing good support, or whatever it happened to be, the usual things you face, we could say, OK, guys, shake hands. We're going to go to the vendor over here. We swap out the product, and we put a new one in with no data migration whatsoever. And as I said earlier, we've, AD touched on it earlier, we've, um, we've done PACS three times. So we started off with AGFA. The national program made us change. Um, and then we've changed again back to Insignia. So we've actually had three com completely different solutions. Now, although there was a lot of work in the doing, in terms of the training and everything else that went along with that, we stopped using one on the Friday and we started using the other one on the Monday. And the reason we could do that is because it's got a, a uniform, fully um, non-proprietary -pro uh, data model. DICOM is a standard. So we didn't have to migrate any data at all. We went ACFA, GE, Insignia, one after the other. And 
the consultants had to be trained, they came in with a different system, but everything carried on as normal. And that was a kind of a real um, eye-opener for us, because w we sat down and thought, well, wow, if we, could, if we could do that with all of our clinical data, wouldn't that be a really, really great place to be? That was the turning point for us. And as a CIO, uh, and we've got the Deputy Chief Exec sat in here today, will be equally interested in this, incremental investment. Um, not saying zero investment, but incremental. We can make cases yearly. We can make cases for the functionality we're doing as we go. And that fits better with the way organisations work, and it certainly sits better with the way we get funding nationally. So, big cross on the left, open standards approach. So then we thought, OK, let's just set this out. I'm not quite sure how clear that will be at the back. Um, so in terms of the layers of the stack, we've got clinical data, documents and images at the bottom. We've got some architectural integration layer across the top. We've got a suite of applications, and we want it all delivered out through Salas, being renamed Seer, to any device. That, that's kind of, that is our, our dream. That is our, where we're trying to get to. Total uh, neutrality at every level. No lock-in, no vendor lock-in at all. Then we had a, I say we had a little bit of luck. I always kind of tell this story. Um, we went out to market for an electronic prescribing solution. We saw a number of proprietary solutions that were in the market. And when we got through to the, the final selection, of preferred supplier, we found ourselves in a very odd place that we couldn't award. So after a year or so of, of procurement, we ended up with, with no supplier. So whilst we were working out what to do next, having never been there before, we got introduced to Morand. Thomas, who you're going to hear from uh, a little later, is the, chief, uh, the CEO of Morand. And Morand had a product, an open EP product, and which wasn't in the UK at the time, and it was completely <coughs> open architected, totally open standards based, based on this open air platform, which I've got to be honest, at the time I didn't know a lot about. I know a fair bit about it now. Um, and that really did fit for us, because when we, when we looked at their model <coughs> for how they would architect uh, their solution, and we looked at ours, they were almost the same. And the point I make is I'm not sure who, who stole whose. I, I keep saying I definitely didn't steal Thomas's. Uh, but the, the approach was, was such a close fit that we thought, you know what, this could be a really, really good way, a really good vehicle to take forward our electronic health record, our dig digital care record. So where we are now, we've still got the same plan, but we've got the little circle on the middle stack there is OpenEP. So that's the first application that sits in this model with an open air repository at the bottom, totally open standard. We've got a total open standard interface architecture sat between it. And once we've done this, the only thing that will keep us using that product is if that product stays good. The other wrinkle with this one is the product's open source. I'll talk about that in a second. So OpenEP is an open source product now being managed by the NHS on behalf of the NHS. Sat on a, a truly open, open air platform. So we are going live, depends who I talk to with this actually. Some, sometime, uh, I was hoping to have this definitive by today, sometime between June and October, um, we will be going live in the hospital on, on one pilot ward with the OpenEP product, fully live on that platform. Um, the key thing for us once we've done that and we've, we've, we've become very comfortable with the architecture, um, the, the, all of the support that sits around it and, and using that product in anger, because I say this is new to us, we're, we're working with these guys very closely, it's all very new. Then the next thing is, what do we do? We want more applications. We want an ED system. We want a maternity system. You know, you, you think of any systems in the hospital. I want them, and I want them tomorrow. That's, that's my requirement. Um, this mechanism, and as we're going to find out a, a bit later on, um, 
is, is one way in which if we can build an ecosystem of, of small to medium enterprises, large enterprises, other trusts, other international organisations, whatever you call it, um, we collaboratively will be able to... Oops, sorry. Uh, we will collaboratively be able to build this, this thing, this suite of applications that goes horizontally across that stack so that we get closer to the Lorenzos, the track cares, the epics, but we have one huge advantage. We're not tied into any of that at all, which I think, you know, is, is a, for me, is a great place to be. We've got a couple of partners that are working with us. The Aperta Foundation, you're going to hear about a bit later on, so I won't talk too much about it. It's basically not for profit. It's the NHS. It's a, a vehicle to manage source, co source code for the open source products. Um, and a, a point I always like to make is it's not all about open source guys. And when we get into the, particularly the commercial uh, discussion this afternoon, the what's in it for us, we can talk in some detail about what's in it for SMEs. Because I'm not standing here, there's, I think there's, there's one of these, um, we need to bust the myth, do a bit of myth busting. Um, this is not all about everybody writing open source to the NHS. Proprietary software is absolutely fine as long as it's licensed in a way we're comfortable with and as long as it's on an open air platform. Those are the two key things. And we'll talk about the specifics of what I think I mean by license appropriate models a bit later on this afternoon rather than talk about it now. Um, but just to be clear, this is, there's plenty of opportunities for commercial partners with this. And we absolutely need commercial partners, if I'm really, really honest with you. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, it's just run, run off the bottom. Our partner is CGI. So we've got a commercial relationship with CGI, who are a massive organisation, um, to help us implement and support the OpenEP product. We're not doing this ourselves, um, and I wouldn't want to do it ourselves. And I think every organisation will need that relationship with somebody to help them do it. So this is a... There are a couple of screenshots. I'm going to whiz through these. Normally, we don't have a demo um, when we do these things, but we've got a demo of this, a live demo later on this afternoon. So this, this is just actually a, a quick couple of screenshots of C-Air, which is the application that is fronting um, OpenEP in the hospital. And I, I'm not easily impressed. I'm a crusty old IT director. This really impresses me, I've got to say. The work that the guys have done with Morand is truly impressive. And it really does set the bar for what can be achieved when we get this relationship right. So for me, as I say, it's all about applications now. We get OpenEP live. We, set, we do more of these. We evangelise. We get the ecosystem in place. We start to get SMEs on board. And we say, right, work with our clinicians and build an ED system. We'll provide that clinical support for you um, and you can come up with a, a subscription-based licensing model for it uh, we can talk about the commercials later but right as an ed system right as a maternity system right as a da 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 system cardiology system theater system x y and z um, our commitment to this program is we are going to make seer open source so there will be at some point it's going to take some work still um, the the application you see this afternoon will be made open source to the Aperta Foundation um, and it will be another deliverable offering to be delivered potentially by a, a solution provider to another trust. So they'll be able to potentially say, I want open EP. The question will be, have you got a portal to sit it under? Yes, fine. Your, your commercial partner will integrate it with that one. If the answer is no, would you like to take SEER? And we'll, we'll implement CR and OpenEP together for you, so you'll have that platform. And then you'll get all the benefits of CR. You'll be able to manage your wards, your beds, your patient flow, and all the things that are already in CR. So this is starting to evolve into a NHS helping the NHS and working with commercial partners, which is what this whole ecosystem is, is about. And as you see at the bottom, that's the key thing, and that it really is today. And you're going to see this throughout the theme of the day. Um, we need local investment. We've, we've got to, our teams have got to be different. There's no doubt about it from what they are today. We've absolutely got to get SMEs engaged. This is, for us, this is all about Plymouth, Devon, the peninsula. What can we do here to generate interest and jobs for, for the Plymouth community? Connections with partners. Again, these events help greatly. 
there'll be lots of lots of opportunities later to network to, to get these links established um, education I'm going to leave because we don't usually have anybody here from education and we've got AC with us uh, coming up next actually I think um, so I'll let him pick up the education piece and national and global this is truly international um, I'm sure Thomas will, will touch on it later um, where this has gone outside of the UK the, all, it doesn't matter where it is if it's on an open air platform it can be done anywhere it, and it can be done for anybody and the key thing is for us total data neutrality total vendor neutrality at all levels in the stack and for me if if the one thing people take away today is is that the one aim of this is complete neutrality at all levels in the stack thank you happy to take a couple of quick questions while we're getting AC mic'd up Hi Andy, it's uh, Dominic McKenney, the CIO at uh, Oxford House. Hello. Um, you, you said that you, you tried a procurement traditionally and it came to uh, a halt because you didn't uh, select anyone and then you happened upon Morand. So uh, what was the procurement approach for that? What was the what, sorry? The procurement approach. Oh, the, we, re, we had to go through exactly the same process. Oh. So um, the only way we knew if the Morand offering, once we'd actually seen it, obviously, um, was fit for purposes, we had to run it through exactly the same um, OBS and, and scoring as we'd done prior. Um, and we, we did that after the event. I mean, this, this didn't, I, I gave the impression it happened overnight. It didn't. It happened over the space of six to nine months. Um, from the initial introduction from CGI, who we were already working with, um, to actually understanding, going out and seeing it, because they're based in Slovenia, so actually going out and seeing the product with clinicians to find out if it was above or below the bar, to then getting the presentations, the scoring, and everything we had to do to, to, to do that due diligence, was probably just under a year, actually, from memory now. Um, so, you know, yeah, we had to, to, to redo it. I thought you might say that. That's a bit disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> Any other questions? Just picking up on the uh, procurement point there, the, I guess the difference is that w what, you, what you're buying to an extent are professional implementation services. Yes. And professional implementation services can be uh, obtained through G Cloud and other digital marketplace frameworks. So when we um, started on this endeavor, particularly where a solution is completely open source and the source code's available in GitHub, therefore anybody to take what you're buying are professional implementation and support services which are can easily be bought through the digital marketplace and, and other things. Absolutely. So you, you don't necessarily need to run a full OG <coughs> for something like this. Absolutely, and I think as we, we'll get into it probably in a little bit more depth this afternoon in terms of the commercials, but um, if we, if we focus our attention more from product onto relationships, we'll, we'll be looking more for an innovation partnership with a supplier that can then deploy managed products that sit on a framework, as, as Peter said. Um, some of those might be open source under a PERTA, some may be a commercial pieces of software sat under a framework. But you would be looking at your innovation partner to bring those to market for you. It's a completely different approach, but it's, it's been tested now. Um, you know, when we had to go through that procurement, none of this was in place so we were very much in traditional um, ways of working but come along this afternoon um, if you're interested in the commercial aspects a question from steve barry steve barry who's watching online he says moving to open source does andy see a reduction in costs um obviously one of the primary drives here is is to reduce cost um, the way we do that won't, won't be necessarily to ask um, to vendors to bring products to market that functionally like for like will necessarily be cheaper than the products that were there before. That's, that would be completely unfair, clearly. Um, what, what we are trying to do is to avoid unnecessary cost. So that the point I made earlier about having to license a product that you're no longer using simply because you can't get off it is, is a sunk cost that, y y you know, everybody would agree is completely stupid. Um, now, clearly, if part of the ecosystem will be 
other trusts. It'll be us doing it for ourselves. Where, where trusts are helping other trusts, like Sierra, for example, well, clearly there'll be a cost saving. We're not looking to sell that product. We're providing that product free to the NHS. Um, the cost then will be the partner, the CGIs or whoever, the partner that helps that other trust to implement it and support it, because we're, we're not interested in supporting that product at all. It'll be supported through a source code collaborative that the new trust would be part of. So it's a very different approach. Um, but in terms of are we going to save money, absolutely. But that's not the driving aim here initially. The driving aim is to set out a new direction of working, which is actually better for the NHS. The costs will come as a, as a facet of that, I think.